We're often joined by uh, Eastern Orthodox Craig Trulia, a Roman Catholic, William Albrecht, and also Protestant Dr. Lee uh, McDonald, who earned his PhD from the University of Edinburgh. Um, he also has a THM from Harvard University. He was the professor of New Testament studies and president of Acadia Divinity School. He's also the author of um, a book that's actually going to be on today's topic, the canon. Uh, his book is The Biblical Canon, and the co-editor of it is The Canon Debate with Jason Sanders. Um, Dr. McDonald, can you hear me? How are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. Excellent. It's great to have you. I know that we are having a little bit of technical issues there, but uh, it, it's nice that you're able to hear us now. So I'm, I'm glad it's working out. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So, I, you know, we have talked about the canon several times on this show, but we've never spoken to somebody of your stature. So it's truly uh, an honor. Let me go ahead and just get started by asking you this. Um, when it comes to the canon, maybe can you just start off by defining what exactly is the canon? When we speak of the canon of scripture, what exactly does that mean? Well, uh, the term canon was originally a reference to a reed that was used as a measuring stick, and it came to refer to uh, that which was used to measure, and then authoritative standards were set up using the term canon, rules for architecture, literature, and so on, uh, and it came to mean within the church the collection of writings that comprise the church's scriptures. Uh, it now refers to the collection of books that are art, the uh, church's Bible, uh, but it doesn't refer to the text of those uh, uh, scriptures, but only the books themselves. The early churches did not use this term when they spoke of their scriptures, but rather the law or the law and the prophets, or they would say, as it is written, as a reference to the sacred uh, writings uh, belonging to Judaism or, and to the early church. Okay. Yeah. And and would you say when it comes to the topic of the church fathers that um, when they looked at the Old Testament canon, did they see the Deuterocanonicals or as Protestants refer to them, the Apocrypha, did they see them as generally, um, I don't want to use the term canonical because I think they used it a little differently. Did they see them as inspired by God? Uh, yeah, those that used them, uh, many of the early church fathers did make use of them and made lists of uh, sacred scriptures that included some of the Deuterocanonicals. Uh, no one lists or cites uh, all of them in the early church fathers or in the uh, canon lists, that uh, lists of those uh, inspired scriptures. Uh, which ones they cite varies. Uh, from church father to church father, and I don't know of one church father that cites all of the Deuterocanonicals, but they didn't call them that uh, at the time. They just, those that used them, uh, used them as scripture. Uh, the term Deuterocanonical, which is common in the Catholic tradition, uh, that's a term that actually came in uh, to, to being in 1566 following the Council of Trent. Uh, before that, uh, all of the words like apocrypha, deuterocanonical, Bible, canon, canonical, uh, pseudepigraphal, those are all later terms that sometimes get in the way of the reality of the past because people didn't distinguish between them. And uh, some of the pseudepigraphal and so-called apocryphal writings were looked upon as scripture by some church fathers, not all. Mm -hmm. uh, very few uh, called all of the books, uh, either of the Old or New Testament, uh, Scripture, uh, excuse me, uh, there were always some that didn't recognize all of the books that we have in our Old Testament and in the New Testament. But uh, uh, that varied for several centuries in the early church fathers. But mm -hmm. uh, eventually that was ironed out by uh, the Catholics at the Council of Trent, and later the Protestants, and uh, the Orthodox Christians have never fully defined the scope of their scriptures. Mm -hmm. Right, and they yeah. use the Deuterocanonicals, and they don't call them uh, uh, just scripture like the others. They call them non-canonical uh, holy scripture. Isn't that a, a bit of a tongue twister? <laughs> uh, or or yeah. they call them the readables uh, following uh, 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 Athanasius in the fourth century, his statement, but uh, uh, the church has never been fully agreed on the scope of its Bible. Uh, 
and especially in terms of its Old Testament. The Protestants follow the uh, Jewish uh, canon of Scripture, uh, in turn, but not the order. They have the same books that are in uh, the Jewish Scriptures, but uh, for their Old Testament, but they don't have the same order uh, in them. But the Catholics and Orthodox use most of the uh, what we call the Deuterocanonicals, uh, or uh, Protestants call them apocryphal books, but uh, that's only the Protestants. Uh, the others uh, use apocryphal for uh, uh, books that are totally rejected and right. uh, sometimes spurious or, or heretical. Right, yeah. So we have to be careful uh, when it comes to using the term Apocrypha, because Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, if they use that term, it's usually for a different set of books than a Protestant. They That's correct. Apocrypha. Yep. Now, you know, you bring up another distinction, non-canonical inspired text. So is it fair to say that a lot of the early church fathers made a distinction between that which was inspired by God and that which was canonical liturgically? To, to me, it seems they made a distinction between the two. Am I correct? Uh, actually, that distinction doesn't seem to appear much before Athanasius, about 330, uh, 367 A.D. is the first to make that distinction. And then it continues on. And some church fathers, like Jerome, thought all of the deuterocanonical writings were... Uh, uh, rejected, and uh, he treated them like Apocrypha. But uh, for the most part, though, uh, the term Apocrypha was used as a way of rejecting texts, uh, but they didn't uh, always uh, reject uh, the same. Uh, St. Augustine uh, wanted all of the uh, Deuterocanonical books in his sacred collection, but um, uh, Jerome did not, and Cyril of Jerusalem didn't uh, uh, he generally followed uh, Jerome in what he accepted, with a couple of exceptions along the way. Okay. Um, and let me ask you one other question, then I want to get Craig's um, thoughts and also have him jump in here and ask any questions that he wants. Uh, then after that, William, I'm going to come to you and have you jump in. Um, let me ask you this. When it comes to the, the Lord Jesus Christ, it seems that um, often when we read his words in the New Testament— um, we are reading his quotes from the Old Testament. They seem to come from the Septuagint. At least that's what this, the inspired author uh, is putting into the lips of Jesus whenever he uh, puts it in Koine Greek. It seems that when he quotes the Old Testament, it's the Septuagint version of the Old Testament on our Lord's lips. So the earliest manuscripts, to my knowledge, that we have of the Septuagint indicate that the Deuterocanonical books seem to have been present. Um, in the canon of the Septuagint. So does that mean that Jesus perhaps would have accepted the Deuterocanonicals as part of Scripture, being that he was quoting from the Septuagint version of the Old Testament? Well, number one, uh, when Jesus spoke, he was not citing the uh, Septuagint, but the writers of the New Testament cited the Septuagint when they told the story of Jesus. I think that's an important distinction to make. Jesus lived in an area where the language was Aramaic, and they would have read the Hebrew scriptures in the synagogue. And uh, now some of the uh, passages, as in Matthew, are clearly more related to the uh, Hebrew, but some are also related to the Greek, which is the Septuagint. But uh, uh, it would be an overstatement to say that Jesus had the Septuagint as his Bible. But let me just add, there are uh, uh, writings that have parallels in the New Testament with the Septuagint, and they are citing Deuterocanonicals. Uh, Hebrews chapter mm -hmm. 1, verse 2 and 3, is citing uh, Wisdom of Solomon 7.25, and uh, Romans uh, 2, four is actually citing uh, uh, Wisdom of Solomon 11.24.25, uh, uh, somewhere in there. And... Uh, uh, Jesus uh, actually uh, gives the words, uh, it's in Matthew 19, verse 28, where he speaks of the Son of Man coming, sitting on the throne of his glory. And that's found paralleled in Matthew 25, uh, verse 31. 
the point of this is the only other place where that is found, those words, uh, the Son of Man coming, sitting on his throne of glory, is found in uh, Enoch, in the parables of Enoch, chapters uh, 47 through 62. So that's uh, that's an important distinction. But Jesus didn't say, gee, I'm going to quote from the Pseudepigrapha now, or I'm going to quote from uh, the uh, Deuterocanonicals. Uh, there were fuzzy boundaries on the uh, uh, scope of the scriptures at that time. They were not fully defined. We have no listing of uh, the Old or New Test, uh, the Old Testament books in the time of Jesus. The earliest that comes about is in one rabbinic text that was rejected from being included in the Mishnah. It's called the Baba Batra 14b text, and it lists all of the books uh, that are found in the Hebrew Bible. But that wasn't even accepted by the Jews, the rabbinic Jews, uh, for centuries later. They're still debating the uh, legitimacy of about six different books that are in the Old Testament, along with Sirach, whether Sirach should have been uh, uh, accepted. I don't know if I'm confusing you, but I'm, I, I want to make clear, uh, we have no evidence that Jesus uh, learned the Septuagint. Uh, those sure. are the writers that are writing the New Testament that are more familiar with the Septuagint, as in Luke and in Mark. Uh, but, uh, there's some parallels with the Hebrew in Matthew and in John. Fair, fair enough distinction, because, you know, I, I would agree that it does appear that the uh, writers of the New Testament were actually putting the Septuagint version, or at least the Greek text, into the lips of Jesus, just to make it a little bit more easier for the readers not to be dishonest, because of course Jesus would have been speaking in Aramaic or reading the Hebrew itself. So I definitely agree. But would it be fair to then say that the apostle who was writing the gospel um, was familiar with the Septuagint and would have considered it uh, part of the canon since the Septuagint contained the Deuterocanonicals? Uh, well, I think it's fair to say that those that made use of it uh, were familiar with it, but uh, here's the other cave a caveat. Uh, we don't know the full scope of the Septuagint in the time of Jesus. Uh, what uh, uh, what we have in the current editions of, of the Septuagint that include the Deuterocanonical writings, we don't have one manuscript in antiquity that includes all of those. And uh, so what was the scope of it at that time? We don't know. And the only thing that we have that has survived antiquity are the Christian copies of the Septuagint. And we know that they made changes in it from time to time. Okay. That was not unusual. Okay. Eric, uh, I'm sorry, Craig, why don't you go ahead and, and jump in here with some of your questions and thoughts on the matter? Sure, and, and I'm going to apologize in advance because uh, I'm going by my questions in memory because I cannot open any other browser in order to stay on the show. Um, so, Dr. McDonald's honor to speak with you. I want to pick up on a, a document you just cited. You said it was a, a, Mish, a Mishnah document or something that had a, yeah. a Hebrew ca canon. What century is that from and what canon, what did it include in it? Okay, the Mishnah was a collection of oral traditions of the Jews that date roughly from uh, about uh, uh, 20 CE or AD uh, up to about uh, 200 AD and uh, or CE. I don't know which ones you're familiar with on the CE or uh, AD. Um, I, I will use AD unless you want to correct me. That's fine. Uh, but uh, the Mishnah uh, had 67 tractates uh, to it, and uh, some of those reveal a lot of the uh, Jewish culture in the Palestine in the time of Jesus, but a lot of them don't. And uh, some of them were produced after the uh, destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and some after the second revolt in the Bar Kokhba rebellion in 135. And so they're culminated uh, at uh, Judah the Prince, uh, puts them together at about 200 to 210. And uh, those were the sacred traditions uh, that uh, were cited. Jesus cites something like that, some of their traditions in Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, in Mark chapter uh, 6 and 7. 
and when somebody wants to dedicate their money to uh, the Lord so they don't have to take care of their parents, and Jesus condemns that, that was an oral tradition. Uh, you, uh, those traditions were uh, amplified and explained in what's called the Talmud that uh, uh, comes almost immediately after the writing of the Mishnah. They begin to uh, trans uh, uh, not translate, but interpret those texts and added more scriptural references to them. And so that from, goes on from about the 3rd century through the 6th century A.D. So from the Mishnah, do we have proof that there were deuterocanonical Deuter books that were uh, accepted as scripture? And which ones would they be? Well, the only one that comes out in the Mishnah uh, and in the uh, rabbinic traditions is uh, Sirach. And they have questions about the legitimacy of Ezekiel because its scope of the uh, uh, the uh, temple and the tabernacle does not coincide with what you find in the law. So some of the Jews uh, rejected that. And then there's a, a famous rabbinic tradition where one man had 50 barrels of oil staying up all night long using oil uh, for day after day after day to try to reconcile Ezekiel with uh, uh, the law. And uh, then uh, Song of Songs is questioned, Esther is questioned, uh, Ezekiel, uh, uh, I, I mentioned Ezekiel, Ecclesiastes is uh, questioned, and uh, Sirach is questioned, and that, uh, there's uh, six of them that go on for quite some period of time uh, among the Jews. Uh, the rabbinic tradition from the second century about 180 A.D. is the uh, Baba Bathra text that I mentioned to you. It's called a Baraita. It, it's an external text. It was not included in the Mishnah, but it was written about the time where it could have been, but it wasn't popular enough to include it. And uh, as late as the 4th century, Jews were speaking of, uh, in 5th century, the Law and the Prophets, not the Law of the Prophets and the Writings. Uh, that's more toward the 6th century where it becomes common. Now, um, I've heard uh, a lot of debate over what scriptures were laid up in the temple. Um, St. Augustine uh, talks about it. Uh, it's kind of referred to in 1 Maccabees. And some apologists will say, we know what's scripture and what's not, because what's really scripture it was, which was laid up in the temple. Are you aware of any known list of what was in the temple before destruction? Yeah, uh, Josephus lets us know that when uh, Titus came in and destroyed Jerusalem, uh, he was given the privilege of taking something from the temple, and uh, also he wanted to have his closest family and friends freed from any persecution, and that was granted by Titus, uh, the Roman who became the Roman emperor. And uh, what scriptures he took, we don't know. Uh, he took them to uh, probably to Rome. Uh, as you uh, you read in his uh, life story, uh, but uh, Josephus never uh, identifies which books are canon and which are not, nor which books were in the temple and which were not. So that's guesswork, and people will go through Josephus's writings, and they're quite extensive, and he doesn't cite all of the books of the uh, Hebrew Bible, uh, and he does cite, uh, he uses Greek mostly, uh, well, his writings are all in Greek, but uh, he also seems to cite with a similar authority the Maccabees uh, uh, and uh, Sirach and Wisdom, and the letter of Aristeus, he seems to think is an inspired text. Uh, the letter of Aristeus dates about 130, and it talks about how the uh, law was uh, translated from Hebrew into Greek. So the antecedent of the Greek was a Hebrew uh, uh, text, but uh, was that text kept in the temple? According to Aristeus' uh, uh, legend, uh, probably uh, it was all from the uh, kept in the temple. Uh, it would have been a good place to keep copies of the scriptures, but which scriptures were they? We don't know. All right, and uh, I have a question about uh, a couple of books in the Orthodox canon. Um, some Orth Eastern Orthodox will hold 4th Maccabees, 
um, as a canonical book, uh, particularly also Third Maccabees um, and also First Esdras. Um, why is there a difference between East and West in these books? And in your view, why were these considered uh, scriptures by Eastern Orthodox? Well, uh, uh, first, as Esdras, of course, is uh, it, it's a combination of uh, uh, the end of Chronicles, uh, Second Chronicles, and ten chapters of Ezra and uh, Nehemiah chapter eight, and uh, those. Uh, uh, there are some scholars who think that actually precedes the current text of Ezra and Nehemiah that we have. And so a number of churches have cited uh, first and second Ezra uh, in their uh, in, in second Ezra, uh, some portions of it are for Ezra and some are uh, called third Ezra and the four Ezra part that and it's a bit confusing to this to lay people. So I hope they will bear with me here the uh, uh four ezra is uh, technically three esdras and it's cited in the russian orthodox uh, text and in fact their old testament ends with that um i made the mistake when i was in moscow a year ago saying that their bible ended with daniel which is true for the eastern orthodox but not the russian orthodox uh, I, 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 I may have forgotten a part of your question, but uh, your question is difficult to answer. Uh, uh, it is found in a number of the surviving manuscripts and the Greek manuscripts and in uh, a couple of others besides. Uh, but uh, the Esdras and the Maccabees, uh, 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 Josephus cites the Maccabees almost as if it's an authoritative text and there's there's no way for us to understand much of the intertestamental period without the Maccabees, the first Maccabees especially. Uh, but um, uh, he cites it, and uh, many of the church fathers accepted it as scripture, but uh, not universally. Uh, the church fathers are all over the map on the acceptance of uh, uh, first and second and third and fourth Mag Maccabees. Uh, the Orthodox, some of the Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox, uh, that would be Syriac, the um, uh, Coptic and uh, Ethiopian Christians and the Armenian Christians, uh, they were much more uh, friendly toward uh, uh, third and fourth Maccabees. But most of the, uh, the Orthodox and the Catholics accepted first and second Maccabees. Now... Why is there a difference between East and West on those books? No, and you are. Um, is there any particular reason why the East is more expansive than the Western tradition? Uh, uh, could you say that again? Uh, the East what? Is there a reason why the Eastern canons are more uh, extensive than the Western canons? Uh, well, uh, interestingly... Uh, the Eastern Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, and the Oriental Orthodox, that's all in the East, uh, they never uh, identified their canon like uh, the Catholics did at Trent. Uh, the Catholics, uh, I'm sorry, the Orthodox do not have, not one of the, and, and by the way, uh, there were seven ecumenical councils of the church. There were a number of local councils. Uh, like the Council of Laodicea, the, the Council at Hippos and uh, uh, Carthage. Uh, but uh, the seven ecumenical councils never discussed uh, which books are in and which books are out. And some people have thought that the Council of Nicaea determined the council. It didn't. Uh, there's nothing that uh, – there was far more flexibility, and you find that in the manuscripts that have survived from both the East and the West. Uh, and, and the churches. Uh, now, if we that. were speaking, yeah, if, if we were, if we were speaking to someone who wasn't Christian, they want to know what the books of the Bible are. How would we know which are in and which are out? Well, uh, I have often said to people that the book that are in, in any one of the Catholic, the Orthodox, and the Protestant canons, nobody is going to go to hell by believing what's in them. 
uh, they they all are within the pale of what the Orthodox Christians uh, held to. The Orthodoxy of the uh, second century is simply reflective of the the teachings of the church in the first century, and the New Testament writings are generally not called scripture until the second century, and uh, uh, mostly toward the end of the second century, but they're often cited as evidence of uh, the teachings of Jesus and the early church. The uh, teachings of Jesus are in the uh, canonical gospels, but Matthew was given priority. It is cited far more, uh, five times more than uh, John, and John significantly more than uh, Luke and Mark. But uh, in the second century, there's just a few faint, uh, faint uh, references to uh, the gospel says, uh, as in Ignatius and also in the Didache, but uh, those, those texts are not uh, called uh, scripture much before the end of the second century. And uh, by the end of the second century, the four gospels are found in Irenaeus as scripture, and uh, but he doesn't give a full listing of the rest of the books that he thought were scripture. By the end of the second century, early third century, uh, the writings of Paul are regularly called scripture, and uh, by the middle of the third century, well, uh, by the time of origin, about 230 to 240, he's beginning to list some books, but not all of them, and he included some of the deuterocanonical books, and he was criticized sharply for uh, recognizing them, and he said he wouldn't give up on something that was so precious and so good. So uh, that, that varies for a period of time. Uh, we sometimes, uh, our thinking traditionally is anachronistic. Uh, whatever we're doing now, we're sure the early Christians did. And that's generally not the case. Uh, but the sacred traditions are what gave rise to uh, the citation of the, of the uh, uh, Christian text that uh, supported that tradition. And Nicaea was critical when it identified who Jesus was. And I have written that uh, I don't think there could have been a biblical canon before they determined who Jesus was. And the writings that uh, cohered with what Nicaea said uh, also were those that were welcomed into the biblical canon. The writings that did not cohere with that were not accepted, uh, but uh, Nicaea never makes a list. It's only after Nicaea, Nicaea is 325, that uh, within 25 years to 30 years, you start seeing a local council as at Laodicea that lists all of the books except the book of Revelation. Uh, a number of the uh, early can uh, 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 canon lists uh, omit the book of Revelation. And their Old Testament often omits uh, uh, Esther. I think Esther's, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Esther is starting to be regularly cited in the Old Testament uh, by the fourth century. It's cited, but not as uh, a part of an Old Testament collection. The terms Old Testament, New Testament, those are late second century, but they're not in vogue until about the fourth century. Uh, Eusebius uh, speaks about the so-called Old Testament or the so-called New Testament writings. So those are the kinds of things that uh, uh, were carried on, and the writings that supported the sacred traditions of the church were the writings that were included in the collections, and they varied around the edges. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox uh, Christians minimized what's called the uh, minor New Testament epistles, 2 Peter, 2 uh, 3 John, and Jude. And uh, the Syriac Christians ignored those and eliminated those books until about the 5th century A.D., along with the book of Revelation. So uh, those things varied, and uh, the uh, Syrian Christians welcomed as scripture uh, the diatessaron of, of Tatian, which was a combination of uh, to make one gospel out of the four and to eliminate the differences in them. The, uh, and that continued on for several centuries. And then they also included 3rd Corinthians and uh, for a period of time, and then the Armenian Christians took it over 
and they continued it up until about uh, the early 1800s in their scripture canons. Now, my last question would be that someone hears all that. How would they know which books God's really speaking in and which ones isn't he? Who do you think has the most accurate list approximately? Would it be the Protestant canon of 66 books or a more extensive canon like the Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholics? Okay, well, all of the main Christian bodies, the uh, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant, all accept the uh, 66 books that are uh, in the Protestant canon. Uh, the, uh, they all accept, in a different order, all of the books in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, so uh, the other books, I, I regularly uh, talk in Protestant churches, and I've done so in Catholic as well, but I regularly say, for pity's sake, read them. There's a lot of neat stuff in those deuterocanonical books. And uh, I, uh, if we wouldn't have a good feeling for the understanding of the New Testament. The New Testament reflects a lot of that literature, uh, and I've listed that in some of my writings. I've made lists of some of the key texts that uh, are cited in the New Testament. Uh, or uh, uh, the verbal parallels are are very strong in a number of places, and uh, uh, so I I have uh, regularly cited that. So I tell people to read it and uh, draw their own conclusions. And many Christians in antiquity said this is scripture, and many did not. Uh, but the large portion of the churches in the West. Uh, uh, namely Catholic, accepted them as sacred scripture without distinction. Uh, but uh, deuterocanonical, when Sextus of Siena uh, called them uh, deuterocanonicals in uh, 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 the uh, uh, 16th century, 1566, uh, he also called the others the proto-canonicals. And very few people uh, know about the proto-canonicals, and the proto-canonicals are simply those uh, books that are without question and uh, welcomed by all three bodies of uh, Christians. So uh, you want me to determine what uh, is scripture? Well, I read it on a regular basis, and I'm, I'm also informed by the Deuterocanonicals, and I cite them from time to time. And, um, and I have told some of the stories uh, in them in churches when I preach, and I do that on a regular basis also. So those are the kinds of things that uh, all of the Christians, uh, the Christian story, the Christian tradition is found in our New Testament. And uh, there were other books that were looked upon as sacred scripture that were Christian writings for a period of time, like the Didache, the Epistle of Barnabas, the Shepherd of Hermas, uh, first and uh, second Clement, but those eventually fell out of that text, but they're still read by the churches. And uh, the Orthodox had the tradition, and they used the term, and they took it over from Athanasius, Anagonos uh, Kamana. Uh, it's a Greek term that simply means readable books. And Athanasius said, these are not scripture, but they're good to read, and there's many good lessons in them. And interestingly, Martin Luther actually said something very similar. He often encouraged people to read some of them, though he didn't want to include them uh, in his Bible. But his people wouldn't let him not include them, so he included them, and he put them between the Old and the New Testament. And most of the Protestant Bibles that included the uh, Deuterocanonicals put them between the Old and New Testament, the Hebrew Old uh, uh, books, but in a different order, and uh, they placed them there. He didn't. Uh, he didn't totally reject them, and he often cited them uh, favorably. But he didn't like Second uh, uh, Clement, uh, be, uh, excuse me, Maccabees, because he thought uh, uh, chapter eleven or twelve. I'll, uh, I'll look it up sometime here. Uh, but uh, he thought, or maybe it's fourteen where he thought it could lead to purgatory, uh, teaching on purgatory, and he didn't accept that. But for the most part, uh, uh, the Protestants welcomed the earliest King James Bible had the uh, apocryphal books in it. 
and in the place where Luther had them between the Old and New Testament. And then they went out of season in almost all Protestant Bibles in the early 1800s, and then they started coming back about the mid-1950s uh, with the RSV uh, that was uh, translated, uh, and it used them, and it placed them between the Old and New Testaments. So, in short, it sounds to me, we have the greatest confidence uh, in the Protestant canon, the 66 books, and it's possible that God inspired the other books. We just don't have the same level of certainty. Well, you know, interestingly, you raise a good question with the term inspired. The early church did not limit inspiration to books. And uh, you'll find in the New Testament where someone was inspired or led by the Spirit, and I cannot distinguish being led by the Spirit and being inspired. And the, uh, the early church didn't make a distinction there either. Pretty much everything that was believed to be true was believed to be inspired. And not all of the writings believed to be inspired were called Scripture. And uh, so that was a part of the confusion in, uh, for us in the early church, but it wasn't the confusion to me. Uh, we we pack uh, the term inspiration with all of our more recent and more modern ideas of what inspiration is. But the early church, if it was true, it was led by the Lord, and it was uh, that which was true was inspired. Uh, if it was speaking about the things of God and the will of God and so on. Uh, so I, I don't know, uh, I'm not trying to skirt your question, but um, uh, how do I know? I've, I've read uh, uh, the New Testament, the Old Testament, uh, regularly, and uh, I find texts that I've read 20, 30 times before, and all of a sudden uh, something else comes out of it that I've never seen before, and I'm blessed by it, and I teach it, and I preach it. Uh, so I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, I read... Uh, the Bible that I uh, normally make use of is the NRSV, but I've been Same here. by people in different churches, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Methodist, uh, Baptist, and so on. What's the best Bible to read? And I said, which one blesses your heart the most? And uh, which one do you like to read the, the most? And they'll tell me. And I said, well, then keep doing it. I don't think you'll go too far afield. Uh, the most popular Bible with Protestants today is the NIV. I prefer the NRSV. I think it has better scholarship attached to it. But uh, I read it uh, when I go to a church that it's all NIV. Okay, I, I'll do that. I gave some lectures about a year ago, or a couple of years ago, in uh, Rome at the Pontifical University in St. Croesus. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I told them I liked the English translation, the uh, Jerusalem uh, Bible, and I liked especially the New Jerusalem Bible yeah. uh, because they, they got a lot of stuff out of there that wasn't appropriate. But uh, that raises the question, what is inspired by God? Is it the book or is it the text of the book or both? Well, a lot of people say it's both, but I say it's it's only the books that are looked upon as canonical, and the text keeps changing. We keep finding more manuscripts that have allowed us uh, to improve on our Greek New Testaments and the Hebrew Bible. A few years ago, I gave a lecture, and I mentioned that there were between 200, uh, scholars are divided on, uh, conservatively, 200,000 variants in the manuscripts that have survived antiquity and uh and i said some scholars say up to four hundred thousand variants and emmanuel Tove, who was there and he, we were both giving lectures uh he's a professor of uh, at hebrew university he came up to me and he said lee there's over nine hundred thousand variants in the hebrew manuscripts that have survived antiquity and i didn't know that and uh but the uh uh, people that say it's got to be this one text, I say, well, which text is it? The Greek New Testament that people use today is the Nestle Elan, the 28th edition, and the or the UBS, United Bible Society Greek text, which is in its fifth edition. 
And then there's Michael Holmes has an addition, and the uh, uh, Tyndale House has just come out with the new Greek uh, uh, tech, uh, text of the New Testament. All four of those vary. There's about four or five hundred variants in the, in the text that they cite. You can't find one manuscript in antiquity that looks exactly like any of the texts that we use today, the Hebrew or the Greek. And so they're all what we call eclectic texts that were selected from a broader collection of texts. And so I, I tell people, uh, read it and ask God to lead you in your reading. And I don't think you'll go too far wrong. And uh, once in a while, I'll find a text. I say, gee, that just... Uh, it, it's found in the King James Bible, but all of the manuscripts that it used don't date before 1100 A.D. So the, uh, we're now almost a thousand years closer to uh, the uh, earliest text, and none of us have a copy of the original. And no scholar makes that claim today. Some think we're closer than others think, but nobody agrees that we have the original text. So what's inspired? I read it, and God speaks to me from it. And uh, I became a Christian when I heard preaching that uh, from the King James Bible. I haven't used the King James for years now, but uh, my life was changed at that point, and that's been true in a variety of translations. And get out of the English language. What about the Chinese or the Hispanics or uh, people around the world? Often they only have one translation. And it's amazing how God has worked in the lives of people through uh, the translations that they have. So I, I'm I'm pretty good with that. I don't know if that's answering your question or looking like I'm skirting it. I'm not trying to. No, no, no. There's no, no issue with skirting here. But I'm going to – I took enough time. I'm going to pass the baton to William to ask a few questions. All right. It, uh, uh, Dr. McDonald, uh, this is William here. It's been such a great, great pleasure having you on. Um, a, a number of really interesting things were, were brought up. A number of interesting things were said. Uh, I really, really uh, enjoyed how uh, you made the point to, to show how some of the early fathers, uh, a, a good number of them, used these books as, as holy writ. There is one, uh, and I remember talking to, you, uh, talking to you about maybe about a week and a half or two back, and I remember we dialogued about it a little bit. And I, I want to, uh, for the for the audience that are listening in, I, I kind of want to pick your brain on it again. When we talk about Athanasius and his 39th festal letter, I believe the 39th or 38th, 39th, I think, when he's talking about the, the canon there, the one thing I found really interesting is that he does include some Deuterocanon canon there, but a lot of them are left out. He doesn't call them apocrypha, but what do we make of the fact, in your opinion, what do we make of the fact that some deuterocanonical books don't make the cut in his canon, but later on in his life, he continues using them, even though he may not call them canon, he'll call them holy writ. What do you, what do you think? How do we, how do we make any sense of that? Well, uh, Athanasius uh, spoke of these readable texts that he thought should be read in private, but not in the church. Uh, the difference between the deuterocanonicals for him would have been what was, uh, and, and the rest of Scripture, would have been what was read in church. That was the aspect of canon, and he uses the term canon, uh, a canonical, uh, in reference to that. But then he has this other collection that he thought was readable, and he mentions them, and then he has some that he rejects altogether. Yeah. Uh, uh, those, uh, uh, I don't know of any church father that lists all of the deuterocanonical books that you'll find at the Council of Trent. Uh, they, they vary. And a part of it is, uh, just think about manuscripts. Uh, uh, we only have, out of... Uh, 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 5,740, and it, it's going to be 50 before long, uh, manuscripts, New Testament manuscripts, we only have about 50 that have the whole of the New Testament in it. And uh, you have to go to about the year 1000, it's 980-something A.D., when you get all of the books of the New Testament and no others in the same manuscript. Uh, and... Of all of the other books, 
uh, there's only about 50 of them that have like a complete New Testament, but by complete, it's complete in the minds of the people that made it, and they often will leave out the book of Revelation or some other right. some other text. So did uh, uh, Athanasius was one of the most brilliant scholars of his generation, and did he list all of the ones that he thought uh, people should read? Maybe he chose the ones that he thought were the best among them. Uh, but uh, others uh, after him thought uh, a broader collection uh, was uh, was would be useful. Uh, but uh, he distinguished them, uh, but he still thought that they had value to them. But nobody is talking like that in the second century or the first century. Yeah. Uh, the notion of canon is just uh, uh, canon as a collection, a uh, fixed collection of books. That's really mostly in the fourth century, from about the middle of the fourth century after after Nicaea, you start seeing uh, all kinds of canon lists that uh, begin to appear right through the next couple of centuries, and uh, you don't have regularity in the books that are included, but also the technology of the books. It's not possible to put all of the books of the Old and New Testament in one volume until about the middle of the 4th century due to the technology of bookmaking, uh, the codex. Uh, the bookmaking process uh, uh, was very slow, and even when uh, uh, those with uh, better advantages uh, could make a manuscript that can, included all of the books of the Old and New Testament, about 1,600 pages, that's fourth century, but uh, when that came out, it's like uh, a Ferrari that has been put on the market, and everybody can see it, but nobody else can afford to own it. And so local congregations uh, seldom had most of the books of either the Old or the New Testament. Uh, they seldom would have more than one gospel and uh, more than uh, a handful of Paul's letters and uh, some of the other, or maybe a few of the others. In the first five centuries, that's typically so. You don't find any uh, translations that have all of the books of the New Testament or the Old Testament in them. So that, that's going to vary for a period of time. Even when lists are made, the practicality of uh, what the local church had uh, and used as Scripture, uh, they didn't have what you and I have today. And we sometimes think, well, gee, they must have been thinking just like we do because they liked all the Deuterocanonicals. They didn't even have all of the canonicals, the proto-canonicals, uh, and their Bibles. Uh, they didn't have a Bible. And, and the term Bible is actually, it starts to be used for a fixed collection. Uh, uh, Jerome mentions the text. He, he uses Tabibia, which means books. And uh, the plural there, Biblos is book, and Biblia is books. It begins to be a formal term for the collection of sacred scriptures about the 9th century to the 10th century A.D. And so most of the people didn't have a full collection of those until you get to the Paris Bibles in the 11th, 12th century A.D. And the Paris Bibles are in Latin, and they include... Uh, most of the Deuterocanonicals that uh, we have that uh, uh, were found in the Council of Trent. Yeah, but that was such a fantastic, fantastic answer. I greatly appreciate that, uh, Dr. McDonald. I I'm curious, uh, but hopping right back on over to, to Athanasius real briefly uh, before I ask another question. Uh, when yeah. we talk about his readables, I'm curious what your opinion is. Would you be of the mindset I think I'm not sure if you said this earlier. Would you be of the mindset that those readables were indeed also viewed as holy writ in Athanasius' mind? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that because he was the the first one to distinguish those okay. uh, those writings from holy writ. But having said that, he saw their value, and especially some of them for the new believers, and. Um, uh, they could be taught and they could be read privately, but they didn't read them in Scripture. Um, I see. You know, interestingly, uh, the, the Orthodox Christians today, all of them, except all 27 books of the New Testament, but none of them uh, ever have the book of Revelation in their liturgy. They never read it in church. Why? 
Uh, I've said I've shown that in some of the Protestant liturgies that uh, go on, and I haven't checked all of the Catholic liturgies, but they all say it's scripture, but nobody wants to read it, <laughs> and uh, it's not an easy book to read. But uh, uh, people have their favorites. Uh, I I traveled around. Uh, for a number of years, uh, speaking on the forgotten books, the Bible, and I stayed with the New Testament books for most of that time, but I got into some of the Old Testament books, and I remember a woman uh, uh, saying that she never read the book of Hebrews because she couldn't get past chapter 1 or 2 and understand anything, and she just needed somebody to help her understand some of that, and it has a lot of Jewish background, and another Uh, I jokingly said to a scholar who's written a very fine commentary on Leviticus, I said, I liked your book on Leviticus so much I stopped reading it in the Bible. Well, we all had a good laugh. But uh, there's some books that are harder for Protestants and Catholics uh, and Christians to understand from the Old Testament than it is for uh, Jews who have a better feel for the culture in which it was written. I, I really... I'm not ready to throw any book out of the Bible. I was recently asked, is there any book that didn't make it into the Bible that you would like to add? And I said, I really like the wisdom, I'm sorry, the Songs of Solomon. It's a Christian uh, collection of texts. There's 42, uh, uh, I could say chapters, but they're really songs uh, in there. And one and a half of them are missing uh, from the text that has survived. And they're They've been put to music recently. Uh, the uh, uh, songwriter for uh, Barbara Streisand and Neil Sedaka put them to music, and they're absolutely drop dead gorgeous. And I find myself singing some of them now and then. And I said, I'm moved by that. And a friend of mine, James Charlesworth, who translated them uh, uh, for the uh, uh, production of that uh, uh, work. Uh, And I've written on the work on how the Odes of Solomon were used in early Christianity, and and they were even called scripture by Lactantios up into the 4th century, and then they dropped out. Uh, I kind of like those, and I wish they hadn't dropped out. And there's some books uh, that are much more informative about the faith, like the Didache, that I enjoy more than 2 Peter, uh, I confess. So... uh, I'm, I'm open to uh, God speaking uh, to me through individuals. We sometimes think of the writers of the New Testament, those are the only ones that God ever inspired to do or say anything. And that's, I think that's, that's an overstatement, and uh, we need to be a little more careful. Uh, the Spirit of God didn't depart from the church at the end of the first century after the book of Revelation was written. And so uh, I, I think the church did some remarkable things in its history. I think it made some terrible mistakes at various points of its, his, its history, and that's why it's important for us to know that so we can avoid some of the same mistakes they made. And I've seen some of those in my own church tradition, uh, Baptist, who uh, ignore church history. They think the Spirit of God departed at the end of the first century and came back when Martin Luther showed up. And I said, uh, if you have that view, you're going to make a lot of mistakes that uh, you don't know the early churches made, and you can't learn from their mistakes if you don't know what those mistakes were. But they also did some good stuff, and uh, we could emulate that, and uh, and I find a great deal of value in it. Great, great, uh, great reply there, Dr. McDonald. I, I do want to ask you um, <clears throat> one one question that I think the the audience would really like to know your your opinion on. Um, it, actually, it's it connected. It's kind of like a two parter, and it connected with the other. For one, do you agree with what Trent says in regards to the canon? And connected to that, connected to that, does the canon of Trent, in your opinion, line up with any? any or with all ancient canonical lists in the early councils of the 4th century? Uh, The answer is no, not in all of them. Uh, uh, The Council of Trent uh, is quite reflective of uh, what you find at uh, Hippos and Carthage. The one at Hippos is lost, but it's repeated in Carthage in 397 and 416. But uh, I, I, and I don't agree with the statement 
uh, at the Council of Trent that if you don't agree with this list of books, you are anathema, because that would eliminate the Orthodox Christians and some Protestant Christians. And uh, I, I, I'm not ready to send anybody to hell because they don't agree with that list. Um, is that list inspired? Well, almost all of the councils say that uh, they were led by the Spirit, but then subsequent councils will counter some of their earlier statements. Uh, do I uh, have a problem with the uh, uh, Deuteronomy Canonicals? No, I don't. I, I like to read them, and uh, uh, I, I have uh, learned a great deal from them. Uh, as well as from the proto-canonicals, uh, as Sixtus uh, from Siena said. But uh, I think uh, we need to be careful if we try to put everybody into the same uh, uh, way of thinking. Uh, if Trent is absolutely right, and if you don't accept Trent, you're anathema, uh, then you got a lot of Christians in the world, millions and millions of Christians that would be going to hell, and I have problem with that. Thank you I very much. Yeah. What makes us Christian, what makes us Christian is the acknowledgement of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that he died on a cross for our sins, was buried and raised again. And uh, I, I believe he's also coming again. And uh, there's a lot of eschatology that uh, who in the world knows, and I don't. Uh, and Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. So uh, I will acknowledge that part, but just just to say there's a better day ahead than has been behind us, and uh, heaven, I believe in that. Uh, those are the kinds of things that I think, uh, I, I heard a guy that graduated from the school that I did in Edinburgh, and he denied that there was a personal God, a God that would even listen to our prayers, who could care less about them. He denied the resurrection, and his book was called Beyond the Resurrection. Wow. I just felt... Everything that he said was so far beyond what was in the pale of Christianity that I couldn't acknowledge him as a Christian, even though he went to a Christian school, traditionally Christian school, and taught in a Christian uh, department in uh, a university. I found that uh, beyond the pale for me. So I think I have room to disagree with different Christians over which books to read or not. But I don't send them to hell because they agree or disagree with me on that matter. But I have problems if we get too far afield from the sacred tradition. Uh, Paul said, if you uh, 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 believe in your heart uh, that uh, Jesus is Lord and uh, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, it's Romans 10, 9 and 10. Uh, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, says Paul. Well, uh, we keep adding on to that, and I was in a church at one time where uh, you also had to be a Republican if you were going to be a Christian, and I, uh, I, I like some Republicans, and I'm, I'm sort of uh, in between. Uh, I'm, I'm registered independent because I found some good people in both parties, and, and I'm not ready to throw everybody out the window. Uh, but uh, my point is, uh, there's some things that are absolute for me, and I just shared those with you, and they go into the New Testament and to the heart of early Christian preaching, and it's a preaching of the gospel. And uh, I shared that in Rome when I was there, and I'm going to be going back again next year, and I'll be sharing some of the same stuff. And uh, interestingly, one of the Catholic priests, uh, uh, during the Q&A time when I gave my lectures, uh, said, uh, Lee, could you tell us, would you be upset if we ask you, could you tell us how you became a Christian? I said, I would love to do that, that I shared with them my story. And then they asked me if I would pray for their colleague who has subsequently passed away, but I said I would, and I did. They had a colleague who was dying of cancer. I couldn't say uh, that they're not Christian. They're absolutely wonderful Christian people. They have a different background, and we have some different uh, things that we stress, but we all acknowledge uh, in the Christian faith, that Christ died, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross for our sins, was buried and raised again. If I get too far afield from that, uh, then we get into trouble and we divide the, the body of Christ. And uh, I, I chaired a national uh, 
a committee uh, in Canada for the Baptists, and they were supposed to come up with a statement of faith. And I started it off by saying, who do you want to exclude from your churches? And they said, well, we don't want to exclude anybody. And I said, then your statement of faith will be very short. And uh, we spent a full week on it, and we came up with two sentences. And that was, they thought they were going to be, be several pages long. And I said, no, the, f the longer your statement of faith is, the, the more it divides. And over the history of the church, we have added to the earliest confessions. The earliest confession we know of is Romans 10, 9, and 10. And you'll find several of them in the New Testament. They generally focus on Jesus. And a few texts will focus on God as creator, but uh, uh, in the Corinthian uh, passage, but uh, 1 Corinthians 8. But the rest of those generally focused upon Jesus. He was the Lord of the church. And um, in the second century, they begin because of uh, the uh, uh, Marcionites uh, and the Gnostics that denied that God was uh, the God of Jesus was the God of creation. Uh, so they started saying that they, in the early, early confessions toward the end of the second century, that they believed in God, the Father of all, and, and creator of all. God was creator. And uh, eventually they put in the church and the Holy Spirit and uh, life everlasting and so on, and the Apostles' Creed. They expanded it. But the more they expanded it, the more... Uh, if we got too far beyond the Apostles' Creed, and I'm okay with that, and the Nicene Creed, well, the 19th Nicene Creed has some negative connotations that some of the church fathers didn't want to use it because it was sending too many people to hell. And I said, I, I don't send anybody to hell. I let that uh, be done by God. Uh, that's not my, my role. But anybody that I can have fellowship with, and I do so in a number of congregations, um, I, I was president of a uh, the Institute for Biblical Research for, uh, I had two three-year terms. That's a maximum that you can have that role. And uh, we have about 1,100 scholars, and we have some Catholics and uh, 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 Protestants of uh, every sort you could imagine, and then anybody can attend our meetings. And uh, we start off with the uh, reading of scripture, a prayer, and often a song uh, of a uh, hymn of the faith. And I, I like that uh, emphasis, and we're the only group at the Society of Biblical Literature and American Academy of Religion that has a worship service on Sunday morning. And we have people from uh, 120 or 30 different denominational groups uh, that uh, show up, and I said, yes, I'm, I'm for that. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. I, I, I greatly appreciate that. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let uh, Michael get his uh, questions in. Yeah, I have uh, two quick questions, and then we're going to get to a few chat questions. Um, one, one is just something that you briefly touched on earlier, and you had noted that the Council of Nicaea did not create the canon, as you you know correctly addressed. Um, you know, I'm not uh, can, going can to say that again. It broke up just a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah, I think you had mentioned something to the effect of that the Council of Nicaea had nothing to do with the formation of the canon, contra the Dan Brown, you know, novel that's out there. Um, now, my question is this: I was reading an epistle from Jerome quite a while back probably eight years ago, so I don't even remember which one it was, but he mentioned in there that the Council of Nicaea had determined the canon, and I haven't been able to find anything, obviously, from the Council of Nicaea itself that had anything to do with the canon. Where did Jerome get that from? Uh, but it, I think it's the implications that you start seeing. Uh, Jerome, of course, is at the end of the 4th and early 5th centuries, uh, uh, he began to see uh, that the Council of Nicaea determined who Jesus was. And that was the critical issue that was dividing Christians, and it separated uh, the Arians uh, from them. Not all Christians, or those who call themselves Christians, followers of Jesus, whichever term you want to use, uh, they didn't all say exactly the same thing on the identity of Jesus. And you'll find Jesus as a spirit, as a God-filled human being as uh, uh, something of both in the second century, but uh, they, they get that straightened out. Uh, 
And uh, most of the early heresies in the second century are focused on uh, the identity of Jesus. And so they, they try to get those settled and uh, uh, by the time of Nicaea, but uh, there's nothing in the Council of Nicaea or in any ecumenical council that lists the books that are in and those that are out. Sure. Hey, uh, Mike, if I can make a brief comment, I think sure. around the same time, uh, Constantine commissioned something like making 30 different Bibles. For example, they include First Clement as one of the books. So maybe that was something Jerome was thinking about too. Yeah. That's something that came in my mind. I think some have speculated. I want to say Codex, Codex Sinaiticus was maybe one of those Bibles that he commissioned, if, if I'm not mistaken. That or Alexander. Okay, okay. Uh, he, uh, he asked Eusebius to put together 50 uh, 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 collections and what we would call Bibles. Uh, and uh, it's possible that Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus were among those, but they're very fragmented, and uh, uh, you uh, drop off, uh, you don't have the pastorals uh, or anything uh, uh, after uh, Hebrews, the middle right. of Hebrews, uh, in, uh, in that, uh, well, not the middle, it's chapter 9, verse, what, 23, or something like that, mm -hmm. um, that's found in the... Uh, 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 Codex Vaticanus, and then the front end of uh, Sinaiticus is missing, and we don't know for sure everything that was in it, but it does include the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those uh, those writings uh, are late uh, 4th century uh, for both of them. I put Vaticanus earlier uh, than Sinaiticus, but some of my scholarly friends and textual critics put uh, Sinaiticus earlier, and I, I, uh, I put it be, uh, a little bit later than Vaticanus, but we don't know if those are the, the copies. They surely, uh, the 50 copies that Constantine, the Roman emperor, uh, had Eusebius put together would have had quite an influence, not only in the uh, surrounding areas of the new, cons uh, uh, the new Rome, Constantinople, uh, the city of Constantine, Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, throughout a number of areas, but they weren't universal. And uh, Athanasius, uh, Athanasius makes a list of books that he thought were in and those that were uh, readable, but uh, not everybody in Egypt at that time, the Coptic Christians and so on, and going further south, the, uh, 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 oh, I'm, I'm trying to think of the uh, uh, the group, uh, the Africans uh, uh, south of there, uh, Ethiopians. Uh, they didn't agree with his collection. I was in a conference, a Society of Biblical Literature, and one person said, well, Athanasius was very influential. His writings were found in Syriac, uh, Syria. And uh, I said, yes, but they didn't follow his suggestions because they rejected uh, at the same time that the letter was sent out uh, to determine when to celebrate uh, uh, Easter, uh, the, uh, they didn't accept all of the books that uh, Athanasius did. So how influential was he? He was a brilliant scholar of his day, and uh, I, I think uh, he spoke for what he thought was probably the majority, but the majority isn't always universal. Uh, it's a majority, but maybe not uh, uh, complete. There are exceptions, and the manuscripts that we have demonstrate that. Some manuscripts include, like Codex Alexandrinus, includes First and Second Clement, and the Wisdom. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Psalms of Solomon uh, in it. Uh, so those are. Uh, uh, there's always somebody uh, that's going to uh, have an exception uh, in the. The uh, uh, stichometry, that's the, uh, uh, a stichometry is uh, counting the letters uh, on a line. And uh, uh, the stichometry of Nicephorus, that's a, a text, and he didn't write it. Uh, he died earlier, but it's at about 850 AD. The stichometry uh, lists all of the books uh, that could be read in the church and their scripture, and then they list them by apocrypha. And I said, if those books that were rejected in the 4th century and everything was all set and the clarification was made, how come they have to list them 
in the ninth century AD if nobody else is reading them. They're still reading those things. And uh, 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 when the Armenian churches uh, got rid of Third Corinthians and the repose of the blessed apostle, which was the death of St. John, uh, there were Christians among the Armenians that were still reading them a hundred years later, which really surprised me. That blew me away. I was a youth pastor in an Armenian congregational church uh, years ago, uh, and I was married in that church, and they treated me very well. But uh, the pastor, every now and then, would cite the uh, Third Corinthians and also the repose of the blessed uh, disciple. Uh, and, and he cited it in a scriptural way. Uh, that was a hundred years after it was cut out. Mm-hmm. Well, um, Dr. McDonald, I have one last question for you before we go to um, some chat questions. And it looks like there's quite a few of them. So um, I'll, I'll make this just very brief. You were mentioning the NA28, the UB5, um, you know, and your preference for an eclectic text, uh, eclectic text when it comes to New Testament and Old Testament, I suppose, textual criticism. Um, Would you put any um, favor, or let me just back it up. What are your thoughts on CBGM, the Coherence-Based Genealogical Method? Have you looked into it much? Is is there anything there? Or um, do you think that the NA28 and UB5 would still take preference over that method? Well, uh, I... Uh, I'm not a textual critic, number one, mm-hmm. but uh, I've looked at the uh, uh, Nestle uh, uh, 28, uh, 28th edition, mm-hmm. and there's uh, almost 500 uh, changes to it in uh, the Michael Holmes uh, that Society of Biblical Literature espouses, and uh, more so in the one at Tyndale House uh, has, and uh, it's mostly, it's almost... Uh, almost exactly like the UBS uh, 5, uh, United Bible Society 5th edition. Uh, But again, I say you can't find one manuscript in antiquity that looks exactly like that Bible. Sure. That Greek New Testament. And uh, whichever one that you want to use, they're all eclectic texts. And the scholars say... These, uh, this portion over here was probably incorrect in this manuscript, but we see 10 other manuscripts that have it differently, and we're going to go with those 10, mm-hmm. and one of them is much earlier. So uh, those are the kinds of things that, that are done. I think we're pretty close to what the originals were, but uh, none of us have the originals. And uh, I've often said to folks who uh, held to... Uh, Verbal plenary inspiration, that means all the words, and uh, 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 plenary is the whole of the New Testament. Every word in it is exact and inspired of God. And I say, well, uh, which text do you have in mind? Was it the Nestle Elan? Was it some of the earlier ones? Was it P45, P46, some of the papyri? We don't have uh, any manuscripts that survive that have all of the words of the New Testament as we have them. So that's the kind of thing that uh, uh, I look at, and I say, I think God inspired the scriptures, uh, and they they work when I preach them and when I teach them, and I've seen lives changed from them. But do we have the exact words? Probably not. If, the, if we had the exact words of Jesus, uh, Matthew wouldn't disagree with Mark and uh, Luke. And John wouldn't disagree with with the others in the eight percent that overlaps in uh, Gospel of John, but mm-hmm. I think we got enough of Jesus uh, to make a pretty strong statement about who he was and what he thought and what he did and the kinds of miracles that uh, he performed. Mm-hmm. And uh, from the New Testament, do all of the books uh, cohere completely? I I don't think so, but I think the message comes through loud and clear. Yeah. Okay. Um, looks like our first question is from CS. He asks, what do you think of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Does new scholarship ever make you rethink your theological beliefs? If so, do you have an example? Uh, do I ever think the... What, uh, well, he's asking, what are your thoughts on the Dead Sea Scrolls? Um, do, does maybe the new scholarship on the Dead Sea Scrolls change any of your theological beliefs? If so, maybe can you give, give an example? Uh, 
no, uh, actually, the Dead Sea Scrolls affirm a great deal, and uh, uh, there are several scholars that have done a good deal of work, and I'm quite familiar with uh, some of the leading uh, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls scholars, uh, Timothy Lim, uh, uh, John Collins, he and Craig Evans and I have a book coming out, and uh, uh, also Emmanuel Tove and several others. Uh, they have shown parallels uh, between the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, the writings of the New Testament. And the parallels aren't uh, a dependence. Uh, the New Testament writers didn't depend on the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they had a shared culture uh, that was current in the time of Jesus. And they overlapped the time of Jesus. Uh, they're done by uh, uh, 68 AD, but in some of the a seen community became Christians, but that uh, uh, they show us also the fluidity. I'm writing a thing for some Jewish scholars right now that I've been asked to write on the fluidity of the Hebrew Bible in its early stages of formation. And uh, the best example you have are the Dead Sea Scrolls. Over uh, and now it used to be there were uh, they thought it was 900 manuscripts, but now they think it's closer to a thousand. Over just over 200 of those have are of the biblical books, mm -hmm. and uh, 700 are the non biblical books. Uh, so, uh, the formation of the Hebrew Bible is a little bit different, and it reflects. Uh, you had uh, uh, fragments of Enoch, uh, first Enoch found at uh, Qumran, mm -hmm. and Jesus, as I shared earlier, is citing from. Uh, well, he's using a phrase, whether Jesus ever read uh, First Enoch, we don't know, but uh, First Enoch was uh, fairly well known, probably written somewhere uh, in Galilee, but uh, that's one scholar's opinion, Jim Charlesworth. Uh, that, uh, that was just uh, the oral traditions about some of those writings were circulating in Palestine in the time of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you see some of those... Uh, uh, that are found at Qumran, and uh, uh, some of the books that are the Deuterocanonicals, there's a couple of them that were found at Qumran. There might have been more if we find uh, Cave uh, Cave 12 was found, but it had been uh, uh, robbed. Uh, but if there's a Cave 13 out there somewhere, or a box of manuscripts in a library or a museum in uh, 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 some... Uh, uh, library and museum in Europe, and there's a number of uh, books, I'm sorry, boxes of manuscripts that have never been uh, tallied, uh, registered, or anything that scholars are working through. There's some that are found in Berlin, and uh, they found a, another gospel uh, uh, a few years ago in a museum in uh, Berlin. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things, there's likely going to be something else that, that comes up, but the Dead Sea Scrolls are very critical in showing us the status of uh, the Hebrew Bible uh, at that time. There was no Hebrew Bible, and there's no listing of these books are sacred and those aren't. Though clearly, uh, the Torah scrolls uh, uh, were the, the, the Pentateuch uh, scrolls were the most popular and uh, uh, found at Qumran, uh, along with. Deuteronomy and the Psalm scrolls. Those are the three most popular uh, uh, scrolls at Qumran. And yeah. interestingly, the books cited most frequently in the New Testament are the Torah, Deuteronomy, and uh, uh, the Psalms. Uh, yeah. Let me let me back up and add Isaiah to that. And those are also the most frequently found in the early church fathers. So there's. Uh, there's considerable over overlap. People have said, uh, scholars said years ago, why do you only find those four major manuscripts? Those are the most frequently cited in the New Testament. Well, they're also the most frequently cited uh, by Jesus and the most frequently cited at Qumran. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I don't Mary. find it uh, to be a, a, a problem. And uh, there's... Uh, in 4QMMT, uh, there's a uh, text uh, that uh, clarifies uh, Matthew 11, where uh, John's disciples come to Jesus and they ask him, 
uh, uh, are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? And he says, the lame walk, the blind see, and the dead are raised. Yeah. That very text is used uh, at 4Q521 is the uh, text. That's found at Qumran, and it's a Messianic text. Mm-hmm. So I think Jesus was claiming that he was Messiah. And so folks have said, mm-hmm. why didn't Jesus just say, I am the Messiah? And some scholars used to say, Jesus never made the claim. But now you'll find uh, texts that suggest that maybe he did. And I, I, I think that's one of the examples. I haven't heard of that argument before about 4 q and I've um, always just thought that he was referencing... Um, yeah, uh, 4Q521 is, is, is not 4QMMT. Uh, that's a different one. I, I okay. apologize for that, but uh, I use that on another uh, okay. situation. But 4Q521. Okay, I was thinking that he was he was quoting from Isaiah, or at least making a reference there. Um, I'll, I'll need to go and look into that. I haven't heard of that before. Yeah. Um, let me ask another yeah. question. This is from Gregorian. Uh, why do you date the Muratorian fragment so late? Um, you know, he doesn't give the date on here that you were um, dating it at. I think it's normally around 180. So what, what, what date would you give it, and why would you give it oh. that date? Okay, I put it in the last quarter of the 4th century to the first uh, decade or two of the 5th century. Mm. And the reason, uh, there's, uh, there's a terrific article, and I've been writing on that uh, for a long time. Uh, uh, there's a number of scholars who say there was a New Testament at the end of the 2nd century, between 180 and about 220. And uh, they cite uh, the Muratorian fragment and uh, that's housed at Milan. Italy, and uh, for a long time, the majority of scholars said that it was a second century document. And then they went from that to saying, this is what everybody thought. There was a New Testament uh, 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 almost complete by the end of the second century. And I have been saying for 30 years, uh, it has no parallels until you get to the last half of the fourth century. None. Now, there's some other arguments that have shown up. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Hermas is called the brother of Pius, the bishop of Rome. That is, has no parallels anywhere outside of the end of the 4th century. And I can give specifics on that. I've got it in, uh, in my book, um, uh, my most recent book. But also, Basilides uh, 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 are... Uh, Miltiades, who's cited as a heretic. He's actually praised by Eusebius for being against the heretics, and he's never called a heretic anywhere else until the end of the 4th century. And uh, uh, the Cata Phrygians are mentioned, and those were the Montanus. In the 2nd century, they were called Montanus, and they're still called Montanus by Eusebius in the 4th century, and then he's Eusebius says, uh, along with the Montanus, he calls them Cata Frigi- uh, Frigians. Uh, that's, uh, there's no evidence of them, uh, the Montanus being called Cata Frigians until the end of the 4th century, early 5th century. And that's the first time we have any reference to the document itself. So that's why I go with the late 4th century and I I regularly tell people, even if it were a second century, it clearly had no influence on anybody at that time. And you can't make uh, uh, a leap from the the one document to say everybody at the same time believed the same thing. And uh, let me give you another example of that. Irenaeus spoke of these four Gospels and no more, and he gave strong arguments for it about 170, 175 A.D. But uh, 25 years later, uh, Serapion, who is the bishop of Antioch, has a problem with the church at Rosas, and they're wanting, uh, the division was going on on whether they could read the Gospel of Peter in their worship service. And he said, if that's all the problem is, then go ahead and read it. Don't worry about it. And then he gets back to uh, uh, Antioch, and he finds the document, and he reads it, and he says, he calls him back and says, no, thank you. Uh, he sends a note back. You can't read that anymore. It's got Gnostic teaching in it. 
Had there been a firmly fixed four gospel collection uh, by Irenaeus's time, why would uh, Serapion, and Eusebius tells us a story, why would Serapion uh, allow the church to read it if it was heresy? Uh, it, it, there were no firm commitments, but by the third century, all of the church fathers are beginning to use the four gospels and those alone. But uh, that's, that wasn't true uh, by the time of uh, Irenaeus at about 170. Okay. Uh, we have another one. And basically to just kind of preface this, um, it seems that Thomas is, is essentially asking, um, would you agree that Judith is quoted as scripture by Paul in 1 Corinthians? And here's his question. Do you agree that Paul irrefutably uses Vulgate Judith 8, 24 through 25 as scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, 9 through 11, especially with verse 11 in conjunction with Romans 15, 4? So uh, essentially, again, would you say that here in 1 Corinthians 10, he's quoting Judith, Vulgate Judith, as scripture. Uh, it, you know, I'm I'm having problems with that, and I I, I hate to ask you to uh, say the same question again, but uh, I, I can repeat it, it if you would like. To follow you. Uh, uh, are you saying Paul was citing a particular text? And, yeah, uh, he's essentially claiming in First Corinthians ten. That cite that Paul is citing Judith or quoting the Vulgate Judith chapter eight twenty four through twenty five as scripture. Um, so would you say that Paul? Makes, did you say the Vulgate? The Vulgate version of Judith. Oh, the Vulgate ver version. Yeah, the uh, Vulgate reading. Said, uh, because uh, the Judith, Vulgate wasn't around when Paul was, but you know, the Vulgate yeah, the reading Vulgate doesn't come into place until uh, the fifth century. Sure, sure, sure. But the Vulgate, re the reading that we find of Judith in ch chapter 8 in the Vulgate, as opposed to the reading of Judith that we would find in the Septuagint, I presume. You know, I, I'm really struggling trying to figure out. Are you, uh, is well, let, question, let's just boil it down to this. Would you say that Paul. Now, is, is your question, is Paul citing something? Uh, or. I, I'm confusing Paul with Judas, and I don't know where he cites Judas, but yeah, uh, fill me in. Well, he's saying in 1 Corinthians 10 through 9, Paul quotes Judas chapter 8, 24 through 25. Yeah, the book of Judas. Oh, Judas, excuse me. I, I'm thinking of Judas, uh, Judah. Uh, oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Turn Jesus over. <laughs> no, so, no, no. That's why I was thoroughly confused. Today, but, no, it's okay. Uh, I, honestly, I, uh, I'd have to go look. I'm in a different room, so I could get a little bit more clear hearing. I'd have to go look that up. Uh, but sure. uh, I know the book of uh, Judith, but uh, uh, I, I just, I, I can't answer that at this point in time. I, I, I'd have to go check and see. Uh, I don't know that uh, I've not heard that Paul was citing that text, but I, uh, I I'd have to go look it up. Uh, I could do that, but I, sure I don't fair, know that you have the time for that. I understand. Um, fair enough. Uh, well, I think that is it as far as the questions. I don't see any others, um, and I know you have to go. Okay. And second, so thank you so much for coming on. I'd love to have you on again. There's so many more. Um, questions that I would have, especially about the Old Testament. Uh, so if you're available, sure. maybe you can uh, get in touch off the air and do that. I would love to have you on again. I'd be happy to come back. Uh, sorry for yeah. the confusion on getting started. Uh, we just didn't have no. a good, clear uh, not a communication. Problem. So, uh, not not a problem. For that. It's probably me being the Neanderthal with technology and uh, I, I couldn't get uh, get good hearing, but I, I hear you not, not an issue. now, and I'll be happy to uh, come back on. That would be excellent. And hey, uh, if you want to go ahead and put in a plug for anything that you're currently doing or a website or how to get in touch with you, any, anything that you want to put in, go ahead and do so now. Well, the um, uh, John Collins from Yale and Craig Evans uh, from Houston and... Uh, uh, and I have a volume coming out with Westminster John Knox Press uh, coming out. It should be out by March, and uh, it's on ancient scriptures. And uh, 
uh, Jewish and Christian scriptures, and we look at the books that made it into the biblical canon and those that did not. And so we deal with uh, uh, deuterocanonicals and pseudepigraphals and uh, both uh, New Testament apocryphal books as well as the canonical. I've got four chapters in it, and John Collins has uh, three, and Greg Evans has two, and then we all pre-write the uh, introduction and the conclusion. And I'm, I'm currently writing some articles uh, that uh, will be forthcoming in the next year or so. Uh, I've got most of them written, but uh, Oxford University Press has asked me to do a, uh, uh, a chapter on the Apocrypha that should be out this next year. And uh, uh, also, the, uh, in, by the Apocrypha, they mean deuterocanonical. And uh, so I always have to clarify that, and I don't use apocrypha in my article, but I use deuterocanonical. And then they have uh, there's uh, have me doing one on the orthodox uh, biblical canon, and uh, so uh, th those are forthcoming. And then I'm doing a thing with the Jewish Publication Society on the fluidity of the uh, Jewish uh, scriptures in their early formation. So excellent. That's that's currently all that i'm doing besides okay. i'm having a lot of fun preaching in some churches good very good well again we're gonna yeah. um see if we can get you on again thank you so much for coming on everybody this was dr lee martin mcdonald author of the biblical canon and the canon debate uh, along with j james sanders you can find those on amazon.com definitely go and check them out william thanks for coming on too thank you for having us on I had a blast all right y'all all right. And everybody, please share this material on your social media. So share, like, subscribe, comment in the uh, chat box whenever this publishes. And then, uh, that should be it. Until next time, go share your faith.